Now he can tell his wife she can deliver. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's three of us here, and I was listed as a presenter, but I'm actually not going to do any presenting. I had my eyes dilated this morning. I can't see a thing. Uh, so uh, Richard and Mark are going to be responsible for this. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so this course responds to um, a problem that's faced with our undergraduate population and is observable by anybody who has had high school kids in the school systems of Long Island or anywhere else for that matter, which is the increasingly small number of seats at the table um, for uh, traditional sort of uh, uh, course subjects. That is, our high schools are, and our grade schools are having to teach an increasingly large number of subjects so classical subjects, which were once prominent, are withering away. One of those is grammar. And something one encounters immediately with our undergraduates coming in, not foreign undergraduates who learn English as a second language, but domestic undergraduates coming from any of the high school systems across the country, is an almost zero knowledge of grammar. Now, in case you think this is an, is an unimportant sort of um, absence in their education, it is, when, with respect to the diagnosis of problems in writing, about what complete knowledge, lack of knowledge of biology is when one goes to a health center and you're asked to explain to somebody or someone is explaining to you what's wrong. That is, when our students come to the writing center and are asked to diagnose a certain kind of problem, the writing instructors often come to them or speak to them in terminology they don't understand, which is classical grammatical terminology. Grammar held a great place in the classical curriculum for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's almost gone now. So Mark and I faced a particular uh, sort of challenge and wanted to develop a particular kind of course, an online course, that would teach students classical analysis of words and sentences. We call the course Anatomy of English Words and Sentence and Sentences, and the biological or anatomical analogy is exact. That is to say, one learns to do these kinds of skills by dissection. And so our course is uh, organized around the idea of dissecting English words and dissecting English sentences. The, the idea here was suggested to us in a way by the TLT folks who said that online instruction is most successful when it emphasizes skills acquisition rather than knowledge acquisition, that is to say, or information acquisition. That is to say, skills that the student can practice over and over again in a self-paced way. So the way that we decided to approach this problem was to develop a course and certain web apps associated with us that would assist students offline and in their own time and at their own pace with learning the classical skills of word analysis and sentence analysis. So um, the, the course is highly instrumental in nature, and the focus is on knowing how as much as knowing that. That is, knowing how to do to break up words into their constituent parts and sentences into their constituent parts. So to develop a skill set. Understanding the internal structure of English words and understanding the internal structure of English sentences. And by the way, I should point out that this kind of knowledge, classical grammatical knowledge, is not only valuable in the context, of, in so to speak, the ancient context of knowing what goes wrong and with people's writing when it goes wrong, but in the modern context as well. The whole point of the World Wide Web is English. In fact, probably broken English, right? Which is also the language of science, broken English. So all of the autonomous web agents, all of the data harvesting agents, 99% of what Google does, and Amazon Speech Group does, and AT&T does, and Lingpipe does, and Nuance does, in the great technology companies that are moving into the New York City area, is analysis of text and analysis of speech. 
And all of it is based on a very firm understanding of what the internal structure, words of the internal structure of sentences is. It makes sense. It's like trying to do chemical analysis without knowing atomic structure. So, modern terms, um, we view the value of grammar um, as a, it was a standard, as I said, a standard high school subject that's fallen by the wayside. I've argued myself that one of the primary goals of teaching traditional grammar and many, many um, classical authors and to this was teaching rational argumentation skills, but it also has these practical consequences as well. Um, we actually teach in our own classes in, in linguistics department grammar and word analysis as a kind of scientific activity. I'd be delighted to talk to you more about that. I don't really have time to go into it in detail at this time. So here's the course. The course that we developed is one based on two components, analysis of English words into their component roots and stems. That's the usual sort of terminology for analysis of English word structure. And analysis of English sentence structure. Classically, that was called parsing. <laughs> Dividing the sentence up into its parts and the way those parts are arranged together to make larger parts. Okay? So, both of these analyses, techniques, oh, both of these um, skill sets are not natural. If you, and you'll see in a minute, if you look at an English word, I fairly well guarantee that you won't necessarily know what the parts are that make that up. That is a skill that, however, is very valuable to know. It's very well, valuable to know, for example, for success on GREs um, and vocabulary acquisition. And students routinely do not know how to parse up a sentence into subject predicate and the internal parts of that as well. So, um, most of these courses, these skills can be taught by repetition and by um, uh, uh, practice. So, we take advantage of the resources of online instruction to teach those ourselves. So, the core of this was the development of certain kind of web applications. We developed three such applications, a flashcard application, a word analysis application, and a sentence analysis application. And they were developed by our web person and app designer, Mark Lindsay, who will tell you a little bit about them. Hello? Hi. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to just launch these. I'm going to just Okay. So the first is, it's fairly straightforward, it's a, it's a flashcard app. So the, the idea here is um, uh, all of these web apps, they are um, designed to be cross-platform and they're kind of, uh, they're working within Blackboard, so this course is working within Blackboard. And all these apps are embedded into the Blackboard application. So as a student goes, when they go into Blackboard and they do their, you know, their module for a certain chapter or a certain section, uh, they go through, and as they go through the different tasks, these um, different apps are sort of embedded into that environment. Um, and so, uh, as we were saying, with the, with the uh, word parsing, uh, the word analysis uh, portion of the course, um, the idea is um, that you have all these Greek and Latin roots, and the very, the, you know, the basic building blocks of the course of knowing all of these, uh, all these roots and what they mean. And so there's a lot of memorization involved. And so the first app is a, is a straightforward, um, but handy, um, easy to use uh, flashcard application. So you can um, basically go through and uh, learn about, so we have lit, lit, uh, that means stone, caper, that means goat, on, that means place, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's set up in such a way that as you go through um, each section, um, the appropriate uh, word sets that correspond to that particular section um, are what the student interacts with. Um, and the student also has the option to um, do some you know, self-paced learning. So they can go ahead um, and learn uh, extra word sets at their own pace. They can also go through and uh, look at a random sampling of uh, all of the chapters that have come before. Um, so this allows for you know, the facilitation of easy self-paced memorization. Um, then the next application takes things to um, sort of the next step where you actually look at these words, um, these complex words that are made up of Latin and Greek roots, and you um, decompose them into their parts. You identify the different parts and then you identify the meaning of those parts. So if, so if you take a word like uh, toponymic, 
Um, do you know where you would parse this word to split it up into its Latin? What are the words? Greek. <laughs> <laughs> no fear. Forget it. <laughs> so, Anybody else besides the Greek? <laughs> Okay, so we'll do, so you can see here you have this, you can highlight here and see that there's like a split point, so we'll say, we'll say topo, and any, any other yeah, part. So you might want to say maybe. Nimi? Yeah. Nimi? Nim, nim, here? Anybody got any answer? Nimi? Nimi? Here? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. And then, okay, so we have a split at topo mimic. Then we want to check the results. So we check it and we see, okay, yep. the green one is correct, the red one is incorrect. And so then if we go back and look at our, at our flashcards and look at the variations, it's actually that it's uh, here, there's actually, so top sometimes shows up as topo in, in other words, but it's actually the, the root is top. And then um, the, the next one is unum, which means. Uh, name. So when you get this right, then you go on to the next part where you say, okay, what do these all mean? Um, so you have your choices, you choose what they what they mean, and then when you check, then it gives you feedback here, uh, which part you got right or wrong. And the, the idea, the, the, the really useful thing here is that you get this instant feedback, um, because these applications are intended not for so much for evaluation, but for um, learning and practice. Right? So being able to have immediate feedback uh, means that it's not just when you get back into the classroom that you have to go back over these things that you've been doing the wrong way. You get this instant feedback as you go wrong. Um, so when we get that right, then we, then we find, okay, top means place, honor means name, ik means adjective, suffix, so it means the quality of a name derived from a place. And then we get to you know, other more complicated ones. Um, we can see, you know, okay, maybe we can be metro here, but actually, uh, if you recognize there's a suffix, or there's a, there's a root ops, you put this together, you guess, dysmetropsia, and then you just take it apart into its, you know, dys means bad, meter means measure, ops means high, and then ia is just the noun suffix, and then we say, okay, this means a condition in which the high measures the objects incorrectly. Um, and then you go along in another thing that you recognize is whether something is Latin or Greek to begin with. So you get to a word like this, you know, you can think of different ways to split it up, but in fact, you know, the, the correct answer here is uh, that this word is unanalyzable. Right? So you, it, has no parts. it has no parts that you would parse out. Right? So you need to identify not only how to do this, but when to do this. Um, and then the last app is uh, based on sentence analysis. I don't know if you want to talk about this. So the classical skill of parsing is to be able to look at a sentence which is represented here by S and is just a big, as it were, unanalyzed block in the, in the way that it's presented and divide it up into its parts um, and to say what kind of parts those parts are. Um, the notion of part of speech actually goes back to 100 BC to Dionysus Brax. And um, when ki kids used to study grammar, what they did was learn those parts and the names of the parts. So for example, the primary division in an English sentence and in the sentence of any language is into a subject and a predicate. Know where that is? Subject is the man. So you click there and it would, what it does is divide it up into, um, now into two larger subparts. And your task as the student is simply to label these and tell what kind of things, that is what these things actually belong to. So um, let's just take the man for example. He's labeling these, we call these now noun phrases and verb phrases. And the man, as a student moves through the, the exercise, it consists of a noun and an, a determiner, or, oh wow, cool. Uh, most people would have said article in the class. That the determiner is the modern terminology, that is absolutely correct. Um, care to make a guess on the division in time, inside the verb phrase? Where does the next break come? Um, interestingly enough, it all depends on how you actually think of this sentence. Whether you think of it as a movie on a cell phone or watched a movie, 
on the cell phone. If you do it this way, yes. If you do it this way, or it's possible that it could be a three-way division. We allow that as well. Some things need ternary divisions like this. So, and then the labeling proceeds as on the roof. Once, uh, go ahead, finish it all that. As in the case of the word analysis application, it's useless to do this unless we have some way of checking what the right answer is. Actually, I don't know if whether, whether Go ahead. So if we do a check like this, it'll it'll indicate what hasn't been done yet. You're not allowed to leave triangles. You should have a complete analysis of the tree. And you're not allowed to leave unlabeled or mystery labeled things like XP or something like that. You really should do the entire thing. By the way, on his cell phone, what's the division there? On his cell phone, right. And then the, the title of the category there, what is this kind of thing? Prepositional phrase. Good. So you guys had classical education. What is an XP? Oh, he just did that so that you could show um, an error. An error. Yeah, oh, it's a noun phrase. And all the way down, articles and prepositions and articles. Yeah, wrong. right. So the, the application gives you feedback in the case in, in which you've done wrong. And when you get it all the way to the end, it accepts what we consider to be the right answer. I'm curious, what is cell phone? Um, cell phone is a compound noun. Yeah, yeah. Actually listed in the dictionary as a single item. It is obviously produced by cell and noun. This is noun noun compounding, which is a very, very common uh, uh, function in English and the Germanic languages. Not so common in Greek. Completely non existent in French. Yeah, it's an extremely interesting question as to why there's some kind of processes. Noun noun compound, pumpkin bus, cell phone, truck driver. Adam Bob. This is a very, very common process in languages like English. It is non-existent in the Romance languages, or close to non-existent, which is an interesting thing. Okay? So that's our course and our applications. Thank you. So right now we're still developing the sentence analyzer. Um, 
but we expect to have the full course and then we hope to extend it to the entire system and then make it available to kids in the Long Island school system. We have great and ambitious plans. Yes? Any initial evidence of a, how much students improve by using the tool and beating the way they I have to mention that they actually enjoy it more because this was left on the stick when I was a <laughs> Yeah. It looks a lot more fun than I would. Right, so, so I'm teaching the course this semester. As I said, we're only doing the word component right now. We're going to add the, the other component when we, when we teach it again next year. Um, I did a pre-test on, on the, the students' vocabulary knowledge, uh, or classical vocabulary knowledge beforehand. I'll do a post-test uh, in May, and so I'll be able to tell you whether they, uh, you know, to what extent they learned something. So that we don't know yet. I can tell you that the students in the class just love it. They love this stuff. They love the flashcards. They love the word analysis. Um, they love the fact that when they do um, uh, the, the uh, assessment, they can repeat something as many times as they want until they get it right, which the computer allows. So the, it's, it really, we feel it's doing what we wanted it to do, which is to use the computer to do, as, as the TLT people say, to use the computer to do what the computer does best, and it, they are enjoying it. Okay, <clears throat> um, so our interest in, uh, uh, in this project is to teach a course that we have been teaching for a long time in the chemistry department in a traditional form. Uh, it used to be called uh, Physical Chemistry uh, Short Course that we very recently renamed as Physical Chemistry for the Life Sciences. The, uh, the target audience is uh, non-chemistry majors and uh, it's a course that uh, during the, it's taught in the spring semester and usually has about uh, 70 or so students. Uh, I have been teaching it, uh, I, I haven't been teaching it in the spring semester, I have been teaching it in the summer uh, session, session one semester and usually the number there of students <laughs> Uh, it fluctuates considerably, uh, but it's uh, on average about 30 students. Uh, last uh, summer, for the first time, 
we try to explore the possibility of reaching more students outside, especially outside Stony Brook and outside uh, New York State, if we could reach them because it's a course, uh, it's a 300 level course that usually is not, uh, or it's, uh, not commonly taught in the sun. So we thought we could capture an audience of life science students that need to take a physical chemistry course at a time where uh, nobody else offers it. Uh, so I taught it for the first time last summer in uh, an online version, but I had quite experience in teaching the course in the summer in uh, the traditional form. So basically the, cor of the course objectives are to familiarize or teach the students so that they learn the core aspects of physical chemistry, thermodynamics, electrochemistry, uh, and other topics. So, uh, as such, is a course that covers a wide variety of topics, uh, some of them familiar to already to the students from previous courses, uh, and many of them completely unfamiliar. Uh, and one of the issues here is to try to convey to students the interrelationship between the subjects within the course and with other courses they have taken before uh, and teach how uh, these topics are applied in practice. Uh, so it is, uh, it's chemistry and physical chemistry in particular is an exact science so a large part of the course involves teaching uh, or having the students learn how to solve problems, numerical problems, how to interpret the results of the problems, and how to connect the problems within a wider context of um, <coughs> how uh, problems like this occur in practice. So, uh, briefly I will outline uh, the parts or, or the techniques that we use in the course. Uh, I told it last summer online and during this last year I have been testing uh, or practicing uh, several other techniques that I didn't use the first time in the courses that I taught each traditionally. So the course is fully uh, organized and delivered through Blackboard. And it has a number of um, uh, deliveries, ways of delivery. First there are the lectures. Uh, I, I'm just going to briefly uh, go over it and then in more detail uh, on, uh, on the top, on, on each of the items. Uh, so the lectures are delivered twice a week. They are quite long, three hours and a half, and they have been pre-recorded. In that summer in session, in session one, uh, I taught the course in a traditional form on a blackboard, and the uh, lectures were recorded through as we capture the ecosystem. So we post the lectures for the students to have access to them at any time. Uh, of course, the course has written assignments, uh, 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 chapters of the book, etc. Uh, what is uh, peculiar to this course and the parts that I find most interesting is the recitation, which is done on a synchronous way, uh, using uh, uh, SD Connect, which is a form of Adobe Connect. Uh, and I will talk about that later. The recitations are twice a week and uh, two hours long. Uh, we have online quizzes delivered uh, through Blackboard. Uh, one of the problems in this type of courses, at least in the chemistry department, we love to have students interact with each other and learn through the interaction. But none of the things I mentioned before are easily usable for student interactions with each other. So we have a discussion forum for uh, promoting those discussions. We also offer practice problems that the students can practice, but we, uh, practice, uh, but before the exams we post detailed solutions so that students can check. And we have exams, online exams, two midterms and a final online. So I will go a little bit over uh, these items. Uh, the lectures, as I mentioned, they have been recorded and they are posted the day before the recitation. So that hopefully in the recitation we can flip things and students can uh, contribute themselves because they are already familiar with the topics. 
so uh, I mentioned they have been recorded in session one uh, of last summer, uh, and a few uh, le uh, a few lectures could not be done in NSB Connect, uh, so I did record them in my office. Um, reading assignments, in addition to um, in addition to assigning topics from the book, we also offer course notes that I wrote. Uh, they are not a replacement for the book, but uh, they try to enlarge and emphasize what has been uh, discussed in the lecture. Uh, in particular, uh, we will, uh, because the lectures have a finite amount of time, we try to uh, cover uh, problems, uh, a selected type of problems uh, that illustrates the uh, techniques of uh, tackling uh, certain topics on how to solve them. Uh, we try to illustrate through selected problems with 10 solutions going uh, thoroughly through them. Uh, what I mentioned, uh, what I forgot to mention about the lectures is that uh, they were done on a blackboard and they include uh, student participation in that particular semester uh, trying to bring the students to the grammar and solve problems uh, through them. So the students that watch the recitations will see also students working on a blackboard. Um, so the recitations, as I mentioned before, recitations are offered synchronously. Uh, and usually we cover, I covered myself, uh, the solution of three or four uh, critically solved, uh, um, solved problems that are specifically chosen to illustrate uh, the techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, they are taught in a synchronous form with SV Connect. Uh, so basically, I have a laptop and I'm sitting in my office and lap the laptop is a tablet PC, an old tablet PC that allows me to write uh, handwritten equations or uh, text uh, with a stylus. Uh, I have a microphone too, the students do not see me but I share the screen with the, for the most part. At the beginning of the lecture they see me through the camera but after I share uh, the content or the screen of the laptop as I write, they can only see the screen and hear my voice. So I write the statement of the problems and work through it. The students can communicate back to me, ask questions or comments uh, through a part of SV Connect, which is basically an instant messaging uh, system. Uh, and as, as soon as I see the message, I can answer them. What they cannot do easily in SV Connect in the way I use it is inter students interacting with each, each other. That when too many students at the same time are writing, the screen flows and it's sort of impossible. Ideally, this should be managed with uh, a host or a mediator that also would help, but I don't have that uh, facility. So I have to devise another way that students can interact with each other, which is a discussion forum. Um, another advantage of SV Connect is that whatever we do uh, is recorded and it can then be posted. So students that cannot attend to the live uh, recitation, they can watch it at their own time, or those who watch it uh, can review it. Uh, discussion forums, well, it's the usual discussion forum that we have on Blackboard, and there I, can t I try to uh, pose questions. This is something I will do for the first time uh, this summer. I'll try, I have devised a number of questions trying to promote discussion either based on problems commenting on the techniques and the range of validity of these techniques or actually trying to connect the contents of the problems with real life applications in particularly on the life science to which, for, which the, the, for which the course is, is uh, oriented to. Um, so, uh, about the grading, which we have not so much, uh, I will use two uh, pieces of this scheme to grade. One is the discussion forums based on participations of students. 
students uh, must comment on uh, the, the questions posted on the forums uh, and they have to elaborate on them. Then we have, after each recitation the following day, we will have online quizzes delivered through Blackboard, uh, available to any students in a window of four hours, so if people who uh, work or have other things to do, they can choose their time. But once they are open, they are open only for two hours. The exams that is what comes next also is uh, based on that. And quizzes will be numerical and conceptual, but the questions will be multiple choice formats so they can be easily graded. On the other hand, the exams are also delivered through Blackboard, but in the exams, uh, we post, I post the questions in essay form. So there is a problem and the students have to, by typing uh, on an editor, they have to manage to write uh, an explanation and the results of how they solve the problem. It doesn't need to be very elegant because for the exam we also have a redo at home where the students uh, can use books or whatever, write a solution in detail, scan it or photographs and submit them to me. And then between the online part and the scan part, I uh, wait them to, to contribute to the grade. Um, so the exams mostly are numerical problems or conceptual questions, uh, answers that in a number just for a problem do not count unless there is an explanation of how the result has been arrived to. Um, okay, so basically those are the main parts of the course and I guess I should conclude saying what motivated me to try to teach this course online. As I mentioned before, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things we would like to is to increase the number of students uh, in the course. We would also, we also teach physical chemistry for chemistry majors and we are interested in trying to move the life science students that are in that physical chemistry for chemistry majors to this course because this course is more uh, oriented towards, is better oriented towards the life sciences. One of the things I found when I first taught this course online is that uh, even though there is an enrollment number, the numbers as the course progresses can change uh, very fast. For example, uh, last summer there were 25 students uh, registered, one of them from Kentucky, for Knox. Uh, but before I could even interact with them for the first time, uh, after I posted the lectures, and notes, uh, before I could interact in a recitation with them, the number went from 25 to 17. Uh, and then as the course progressed, uh, seven, uh, it went from 17 to 13, 13 ended the course. So uh, this seems to be very common on courses online, the, uh, the very fast rate of the search, especially in MOOCs courses. Uh, it's something that I'm trying to see if with the changes I made for this time I can have better, uh, I, I can improve the, in retaining students. The other thing I uh, was uh, interested in is to see if through teaching this course, learning the techniques that one uses online, I can then apply them to the traditional courses I teach uh, during the semester. And one thing that I found, and so I have been trying several of these things during the semester, and one thing that is uh, very, very efficient, I teach really large courses, uh, general chemistry, uh, where in the off semester, which is mainly when I teach in the fall, and there can be general chemistry too, about 300, 350 students. Before the exams, one has to do a review session, has to uh, find a classroom that has blackboards uh, for at least 200 people, accommodate the students and then reserve the room for three hours and go through problems or whatever. Uh, I have found that using SD Connect for doing the review where everybody can uh, log in or even if they don't log in, the session is recorded and posted online and then the students can access to it. 
is far more efficient. For me, it's much easier. Instead of, instead of explaining in a blackboard to a very large audience, I just have to sort of a one-on-one -on -one explanation to the computer. Everybody listens and can ask to the instant messaging. Um, okay, I thank you very much. I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to Pat, uh, Patricia uh, and to Jennifer Adams and Jennifer Jaiswald that have been, which have been extremely helpful uh, throughout the years and saved my life when, when I taught the course for the first time online. Thank you very much.